In the entertainment business, there's something called an EGOT. Someone who has won an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. E-G-O-T. Audrey Hepburn and John Legend are amongst the very short list of performers who have achieved the feat. But what about an EGOT of racing? We here at Donut propose the Finns, winning in Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, and sports cars, or Finns. There are only three Finns in the entire history of auto racing. The full list is Mario Andretti, Juan Pablo Montoya, and the first driver to ever earn a Finns, the one and only Dan Gurney. Dan seemed to attract honors wherever he went. Car and Driver even nominated him for president in 1964, printing a run of red, white, and blue bumper stickers that declared him the Car and Driver candidate. The reasons were more emotional than practical. Quote, look at him from a purely political, non-automotive standpoint, wrote David E. Davis Jr. in the July 1964 issue. Say his name aloud, Daniel Sexton Gurney. President Daniel Sexton Gurney. What a sound, as though he was preordained to take the job. Not to mention that he was only 33 at the time. The Constitution requires the president to be at least 35. But car and driver, for one, was willing to make an exception. Today on Pass Gas, we know Dan Gurney is a Finns, but is he a goat? What made him such an incredible interdisciplinary driver? How did a blue collar kid who grew up in an orange grove help Carroll Shelby bring American design to Formula One? And what the f is a gurney flap? I'm proud to announce that the past gas candidate for the 2024 presidential election is none other than our very own James Hubert Pumphrey. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and vote. This is Pass Gas. Pass Gas Podcast. Hey you, got bush? You definitely do if you haven't tried the best products from our sponsor today, Manscaped. After using these life-changing products, you're gonna wanna join a ball sack beauty contest. If that exists, who knows? I don't wanna know. I'm looking out for you because I also have an exclusive 20% off discount code, gas20 at manscaped.com. You ever like realize how big your bush is getting and you look around for things to cut it off with well the cool thing about manscaped is that you never have to worry about finding an old rusty scissors again manscaped is dedicated to helping you level up your full body grooming game with their perfect package 3.0 kit this kit comes with the essential lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer plus a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your grooming routine Honestly, this is my favorite trimmer I've ever used, and I'm not just saying that because they're paying me. The Lawnmower 3.0 is honestly the best trimmer I've ever used. It works flawlessly every time, and there's no worry of like nicking yourself because it has this advanced skin safe technology. Plus, you know, like when you trim the bushes, like the tree stands taller, so it's a big confidence boost. Also inside the perfect package, you'll find the Manscaped Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. This is something that all guys can use. And also the Crop Reviver Ball Toner, which is a spray-on testy toner that's designed to make your balls smell irresistible. And be sure to add their refined cologne to your arsenal. With a perfect package or performance package purchase, you get two free gifts. You get the Shed Travel Bag, which is a $39 value, and the patented high-performance Reduced Chafing Manscaped Boxers, which honestly are my second favorite thing. So get 20% off plus free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. And two free gifts. That's 20% off, free shipping, manscaped.com, and use the code GAS20. It's 2021, you still got Bush? Change that with Manscaped. Thank you, Manscaped. I want to give a big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil. You already know what it is. I got my Valvoline hat on right now, and that can only mean Valvoline is sponsoring this episode. Valvoline is the original motor oil. They were the first. Not only were they the first patented motor oil brand, they've also had many firsts in the industry. All right, guys, they were the first high mileage oil, the first synthetic blend, and the first racing oil. That's a lot of big firsts, okay? That's pretty impressive. And guess what? They've never stopped innovating. They're constantly reinventing formulas to provide the ultimate protection for every engine on the road today. In fact, every motor oil Valvoline makes has recently been reformulated to provide 40% better wear protection than industry standards. 40%! Woo! It's a lot. Valvoline has proven to maximize engine life by fighting the four main causes of engine breakdown. Those are heat, friction, wear, and deposits. 
you know what? Another reason we love Valvoline around here in these parts of past gas. <laughs> They've been synonymous with some of the greatest racers of all time. I'm talking Mark Martin, Cale Yarbrough, AJ Foyt, and our new NASCAR Cup champion, Chase Elliott in that number nine Napa car. Whew. I don't, I've, I'm on another one today, guys. I just, I'm just so excited to be talking about Valvoline. Do yourself a favor and make sure you choose Valvoline in your car. Head on over to Valvoline.com slash original to find the right oil for your engine. Valvoline, thank you very much for sponsoring Pass Gas. I love wearing this hat. Welcome to the Donut Podcast Network. How many fins have you guys seen in their underpants? I've seen one. What? What's the question? How, the fins. I saw. I saw. I've seen Mario Andretti in his underpants. I. Oh. <laughs> I have not seen Mario or Juan Pablo in their underpants. I have a picture uh, with the fins. I have a picture with Mario, which I'm very stoked on. Uh, yeah, you look. You look so young in that. I know. That's what that Southern California sunshine does to a, a California <laughs> boy. Is uh, makes him look Ages. good in, in some good some good natural lighting it makes you look good for about 10 years and then you start turning into like a baseball mitt looking leather boy that's why i've been uh i've really started getting uh, into skincare and putting lotion on yes uh, definitely yeah me and nolan have really gotten into putting lotion on each other yeah <laughs> just really just <laughs> lathering up yeah you we know? are so like just sticky <laughs> 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 welcome to pass gas everyone i'm your host nolan sykes joined as always by my two co-hosts joe weber keep it juiced and james pumphrey who's wearing a chain today keep it juiced <laughs> joe made the beat is yours real or is it turning your neck green yet it's not turning my neck green yet it is not real uh <laughs> this is from i shot a kickstarter video for a oh, product yeah. that we're uh, that donut is launching. Dude, you looked really cool in that yellow jumpsuit. I was, I felt so good. You looked I felt good. like a Chris Penn character. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't feel like Chris Penn because I don't want to be Chris Penn, but no. I felt like a Chris Penn character. Like, I'm going to F you up. Yeah, you went from Kevin Farley to Chris Penn in one <laughs> photo shoot. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, today we're talking about Dan Gurney, a guy uh, who I actually don't know a lot about. He comes up a lot in our research for, you know, whenever we talk about American racing in the 60s and 70s, his name comes yeah, up. Yeah, he's one of those guys who's like just sort of involved in every story. Yeah. Like yeah. Ev every American automotive story and then like a lot of a lot of European and international he's, stories. He's like the he, gas crisis of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%. It's like, and then Dan Gurney showed up and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, learning, looking forward to learning about him and hopefully getting a much greater understanding and appreciation of the man. So let's, uh, let's get into it, yeah? Dan Gurney was born on April 13th, 1931, the son of John Gurney and Roma Sexton. The two had met at Oberlin College in Ohio, where they were nicknamed the, the Golden Couple for their good looks and talent. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's pretty sick. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it was sarcastic. You know, it's like, oh, here comes the golden couple. Yeah. Like John Gurney was like really into musical theater and could sing kind of well, but like. Dan Gurney. No, no, John Gurney, his dad. Oh. Oh, his dad and his mom were the golden couple? Yeah. Sorry, guys. Come on, James. <laughs> I'm just going to move on. It's my birthday. I'm already drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Dan wasn't born with a silver spoon of privilege, but rather a gold star of family achievement. His dad was the lead basso at the Metropolitan Opera of New York and also sang on Broadway. I nailed it. I was totally <laughs> guessing that his dad was a musical theater guy. <laughs> no way. You, were, you weren't even guessing. You were joking. Yeah, I was joking. Oh, my God. I love it. I have a lot of respect for people who can just stand up and sing in front of people because that's like my biggest fear. I can't do that. One step ahead of the bad guys, two <laughs> steps ahead of the square. I steal only what I can afford. Oh my God, and my respect everything. level, my respect level just went through wow. the roof. Wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> There's more where that came from, Joe. Hit me up after the pod. <laughs> Wanting a simpler life, John relocated the family from New York to Riverside, California, buying and operating a citrus orchard and giving up the opera for oranges. Wow. Soon after, Dan got a motorcycle, learning to drive in his dad's orange groves. He showed an aptitude for both mechanics and racing, building a race car with a Ford flathead engine that he got up to the speed of 138 miles per hour at the Bonneville Salt Flats. That's Dude, pretty rad. I am so jealous of this upbringing. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine your dad just got freaking orange grove and you have a motorcycle and you're just cruising around your dad's orange grove while he sings you beautiful songs? Yeah. And feeds you orange slices. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because your hands are too dirty to peel them yourself. <laughs> a life in cars was interrupted by Dan getting drafted for the Korean War. After serving his tour, Dan returned stateside and started racing in earnest, beginning with the Triumph TR2 sports car in 1955. Soon, however, he ran out of cash to fund his racing. In his own words, quote, Dan had very few pennies to my name, a young family to support, and I was trying to break into the flourishing Southern California sports car racing scene, dude. <laughs> very Riverside, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dan and a friend by the name of Skip Hudson were outsiders looking in, hanging out at restaurants like the Steering Wheel in Montebello and the Grand Prix <laughs> in Los Angeles, hoping to make contacts who allow them to drive their car. I love like, that their strategy. This is the best life. Yeah, yeah. this is amazing. I love I just imagine. The day, they, like there used to be, like now we have Reddit threads. Ooh, fun. There used to be <laughs> bars called the steering wheel. Yeah. And if you were into cars, you would hang out at the steering wheel looking for people to let you drive their race car. I love that. It's so easy. Like, it's so, I love how on the nose that time yeah. was where it's like, oh, yeah, like, Ooh. I like cars. Let's go to the car themed place. And, yeah, it, like, and it's yeah. not head, cheesy, you know? <laughs> in my head, this is, they're like the cars from cars going to like the <laughs> <Yeah>. driving. <laughs> like, I know we're like early on into the script, uh, but so far, I have never been more jealous of a human being than I currently am of Dan Gurney. I spent the last year in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't tell you like the first place to go in LA to look, to hope to run into a racing car driver. You know, so much has changed. Yeah. The wheel bearing. The we Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> I mean, there's like kind of, there's like places like up in uh, Angeles Crest and there's like, some Oh, like, like Newcomb's ranch. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Probably like the first like, place. Iconic. Like, uh, pit stop places but like not like this no nah. it was during one of these long fly in the wall nights that gurney finally made a connection that would pay off frank archiero archiero was a rags to riches story himself born in italy he'd emigrated to the states at the age of 14 passing through ellis island to detroit where his dad worked construction before getting a job at chrysler frank got into the construction business himself making a fortune as a concrete contractor. But his passion was cars and racing, and he was known to have an eye for talent. Along with Gurney, Archiero would at one time or another back drivers like Jim Clark, Parnelli Jones, Al and Bobby Unser, and Michael Andretti. That's a freaking, that's a killer's row. That's a stable right there. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a scuderia right there. <laughs> Whatever that it factor was, Archiero saw something in Dan Gurney, and after Archiero's driver for the inaugural Riverside Sports Car Club of America race defected to another team, he gave Dan his shot, lending him the use of a 4.9 liter Ferrari nicknamed the Red Beast for Dan to drive. Damn, dude. That's a sick nickname for me. <laughs> <laughs> It was on such short notice that Dan's name wasn't even printed on the program. Amongst Dan's competition, his name most definitely included in the program was a driver who was rapidly becoming one of the hottest names in racing, Carol Shelby, piloting a 450S V8 Maserati. 
As the race got underway, Shelby got off to an early lead, but spun out a couple laps in, giving Dan a chance to pass and joust for the lead with a few other drivers. The crowd went crazy for the literally unknown driver. The only thing they knew about him was that he was a Riverside local, but that was enough to back him. Although Shelby came back to win the race, Gurney made a strong first impression. Riverside seems like a like a locals only type of place where they, you know. Uh, well, Riverside was that that track for a long time was one of the premier tracks in California. Uh, it's like just one of those iconic like '60s and '70s uh, race tracks. Unfortunately, I think it got um, it's no longer around. I think they put like a housing tract on it or something like that. Uh, There's a just, Chuck E. Cheese on it now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Uh, the yeah. biggest parking lot in the world. <laughs> but uh, there's like there's, showbiz pizza. <laughs> there's there's mods you can you can find like people have handmade rip, like rebuilt Riverside in for like a set of Corsa and stuff like that. Oh, so that's cool. You can drive it still. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, yeah but cool. like this doesn't exist anymore. You know what I mean? Like Carol Shelby at this point was, you know, on some level a celebrity, mm-hmm. you know, like this guy like was a professional race car driver and you're like at this thing watching this awesome guy that you've heard of race and then he spins out and all of a sudden this dude winning it's like dude that guy is from here yeah (laughs) you're like what it's like dude that guy's from here dude (laughs) it's like oh sick (laughs) like go dude (laughs) like go pretty sure that guy dated my friend's girl (laughs) yeah i mean today's like my birthday and i'm like getting old so i think like (laughs) <laughs> Maybe this just happens when you get old, but like I am s- so jealous of this time uh, in history. Like, yeah, I wish I wish I lived. Well, I would probably be dead, but I wish I lived back then so hard. The sound and and was just like part of this scene. Like this to me, like Carol Shelby and Dan Gurney and like uh, all the dudes like surrounding those guys. That's my Rat Pack. <laughs> like that those are the these are the coolest men who have ever lived during the coolest time in the thing that I love. And there's just such like a rugged rawness to it too where it's just like and he hand built this engine and then drove yeah. it out to the desert and won yeah. after yeah, 18 yeah. hours yeah. or it's like <laughs> right, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He 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 got four old Oldsmobile engines <laughs> threw them into a tube chassis frame flew it shipped it to france and beat the italians <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <sighs> anyway dan was now in on the closed off world of race car drivers that had seemed impenetrable for years the races after party took place at a local haunt called the mission inn and as he entered carol shelby got a standing ovation but when dan entered the crowd stood once again, showering their applause on a newly minted hometown hero, Dan Kearney. For a second, I thought you were going to say, they stood up and started booing him. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> but when Dan Gurney entered, everyone laid down on the floor, face down, <laughs> and farted in unison. <laughs> what? <laughs> it's a Riverside thing. Locals only. <laughs> That race in Riverside, perhaps aided by the fact that Dan hadn't actually beat Shelby, led to a lasting friendship between the two drivers. Both men made the trip out to Europe racing in Formula Un as well as the sports car circuit. <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> like, Formula is just a thing. It's like one of the things I do. You know? <laughs> I make my own cars. Um, I race Formula One. I have eight kids. They won Formula One and flew back to the steering wheel in Riverside to celebrate. <laughs> yeah. They got hammered and then rode their motorcycles <laughs> over the ocean. <laughs> what? <laughs> Dan was only 21 at this point. Uh, and the North American Ferrari importer Luigi Cianetti had invited him to race a Ferrari Testarossa at Le Mans. It was Dan's first trip to Europe. Not a bad way to make his debut on the continent. I think this Luigi guy, he was like one of the only Ferrari dealers 
in North America. I think he was mm-hmm. like the East Coast guy, I'm pretty sure. Uh, He's also a character in Cars, uh, which makes me think that they based Cars off of Dan Gurney's life. Really? I don't know. <laughs> not, not <laughs> well, because, I mean, it's later on in the script, but Dan Gurney sort of like loses his way, and then Larry the Cable Guy <laughs> helps him refocus and become a champ again. Wow. Multifaceted. Yeah, it's crazy. In 1960, Gurney broke through in a big way, winning the Nürburgring 1000 kilometer race, an event in the FIA Sports Car Championship. Gurney and his co driver, a, a guy named Sterling Moss, uh, this is like, this is just like, like this is like one night in Miami, but like for racing. <laughs> Sterling Moss drove a Maserati Tipo sixty one, nicknamed the Birdcage Maserati, for the complex chassis of two hundred steel tubes welded together in triangle shapes. An innovative design for the time that allowed the car to run at a lighter weight than most of its competitors. Gurney was also finding his way in Formula Un. Debuting for Scuderia Ferrari at the 1959 French Grand Prix. From there, he became something of a journeyman, racing for BRM, Porsche, Lotus, and Brabham over the next five years. Hmm. In 1962, Dan made history for both himself and his team, driving for Porsche at the French Grand Prix. It was a classic American abroad situation. Dan, who stood at a very unjockey like six foot four, Barely fit into his what? Porsche 804. Like, and he's taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm tall. Okay? <laughs> I'm tall. It's like one of the reasons like any girl has ever liked me. I'm tall. I'm 6'3". I'm a tall guy. Very often, biggest guy in the room. All right? All my friends' dads called me big guy in high school. All right? <laughs> Guys taller than me? <laughs> That's like one thing I have over Lewis Hamilton. Also, he's like 22 at this point, and he's driven <laughs> yeah. for Ferrari and Porsche. <laughs> yeah, he's driven at Le Mans. He's driving it in F1. Oh, and Lotus, Brabham. Dude, if if someone if someone wrote this guy into a movie, I'd be like, this movie sucks. <laughs> like, right? Yeah, right. Hey guys and gals, when it comes to car insurance and home insurance, don't we deserve better? I know I do. I know you do as well. I know you deserve better, Greg. So I put my policy to test and I turned to Gabby. I thought it was someone's name, but Gabby actually stands for get a better insurance. That's clever. Getting better insurance with Gabby means a better price for the same insurance coverage. Who knew something like that existed? I didn't. Greg, did you know? They're the one true comparison platform with real rates. They give you an apples to apples comparison of your current coverage with 40 of the top insurance providers like Progressive, Nationwide, and Travelers, all in one place. Use your current insurance information to get started and in just minutes, you'll be able to see quotes for the exact same coverage you currently have. And it's free. That's what I did. I put my monthly Mercury insurance payment in there. They found me a better rate in like less than a minute. And that's the whole point of it is you get to see like how your rate compares to all these other different companies and if you're overpaying or not. Gabby customers save an average of $961 per year. And the best part is they never sell your information, so that's pretty cool. No spam calls, no robocalls, no spam emails. So put your policy to the test like I did. Get a better insurance. It's totally free to check and there's no obligation to switch plans or whatever. So go to gabby.com slash GAS. That's G-A-B-I dot com slash G-A-S. Gabby.com slash gas. Give it gas. Another huge thank you to our sponsor for this week's episode. You already know what it is. I got the hat on. It is Valvoline Motor Oil. You know I love my Valvoline. Valvoline is the original motor oil. You already heard me say that. They were the first patented motor oil brand. They also had many firsts like the first high mileage oil. Check. The first synthetic blend. Check. And the first racing oil. Check. Those are huge innovations. A few weeks ago, went on a camping trip with my girlfriend, very lovely, and beforehand I was like, you know what, this this oil in here, it's been in here for a little while, I'm going to go get some Valvoline high mileage oil for my car. She's running super awesome. 
And uh, I know it's running awesome because every motor oil Valvoline makes has been recently formulated to provide 40% better wear protection than the industry standards. Valvoline oils fight the four main causes of engine breakdown. That's heat, friction, wear, and deposits. You don't want any of that crap. Not only do their delicious oils fight for your engine, Valvoline itself has been fighting alongside some of the best racers of all time. I'm talking Mark Martin, Kale Yarborough, AJ Foyt, and the new NASCAR ch Cup champion, NASCAR Cup champion, Chase Elliott, number nine, you know what it is. I love Valvoline, and Valvoline loves you. Do yourself a favor, make sure you choose Valvoline for your car. Head on over to valvoline.com slash original to find the right oil for your engine. Valvoline, man, thank you so much for working with us. Put it in your car. So he's six foot four, and he barely fit into his tiny Porsche 804. The top of his helmet nearly poked out of the car's slipstream. <laughs> Despite the size issues, Gurney prevailed for his first ever F1 win, also giving Porsche their first Grand Prix win ever. Most memorably, after Jim Clark passed away, Dan was called over by one of Jim's relatives. The relative wanted to give Dan the information that in the days before his death, Jim had been reminiscing about his time in F1. Dan Gurney, Clark had said, was the only driver he had ever feared. In Dan's words, it was the biggest compliment that he ever received. Dan was also making regular trips back to the States for racing events. In 1962, he kicked off a long string of appearances at the Indy 500, debuting in a rear-engine car designed by Mickey Thompson. Gurney would race the 500. <laughs> <laughs> Just like every person in this story has their name on a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then a little known pit boy by the name of Cher. Uh, <laughs> yeah. like, what? <laughs> and and that and that bellhop was Bruno Mars. <laughs> <laughs> Danny would race the 500 every year from 1962 to 1970, coming ever more tantalizingly close to victory. Although he never won the race, he finished second, second, and third in his final three appearances. Whoa. Dude, I just want to like go back to Jim Clark saying that he's like the only Gurney's the only driver he ever feared. Like, just to put that in context, like Clark is like one of the most legendary drivers in British history. Like, this guy's a national icon. He's a hero. He died at the Hockenheim Ring. Uh it's just like, imagine, this is like, okay, James, how do we put this in perspective for you? <laughs> like, that's like saying, like, LeBron says, you're the only man that he fears, you know? Yeah, James Pumphrey is the only player I ever fear. Yeah. <laughs> that's just insane. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I was, I was trying to think of a, an analogy, too, because I don't think Jim Clark is LeBron. Um. LeBron's the greatest basketball player ever. Um, I think Jim Clark is like maybe like a like a Charles Barkley. A or like Shaq. a like a Shaq. a Shaq. I mean a Shaq still, yeah. Yeah, like I, you're, gonna get, you're gonna like, get you're gonna get some DMs from some Brits. I'm just warning you yeah, right now. But if if like if Shaq is like, yo, he's the only player I've ever feared. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the early sixties, Carol Shelby was busy becoming Carol Shelby. In 1962, he founded Shelby American with the goal of creating an all-American sports car company to vie with the European Grand Chiens. That's big dogs in French. That yeah, means big dogs in French. So if you can't run with the Grand Chiens, <laughs> stay on Le Porch. <laughs> <laughs> From the beginning, Carol Shelby had Dan Gurney, born in New York, raised in California, blue collar, a war vet, uh, actually, a conflict vet. The dude had practically everything America uh, wanted in the 50s and 60s. So he had Dan in mind as a driver for his cars. And it didn't hurt that Dan was lightning fast and building a reputation for his racing versatility. In 1963, Dan notched his first win in a Shelby Cobra racing at Bridgehampton. It was historic, not just for Dan and Shelby, but for the red, white, and blue. It marked the first time an American driver driving an American car had ever won an FIA race. Wow. Hmm. At Targo Florio in May of 1964, Shelby entered four Cobras into the race. As the event continued, three of the four cars broke down. Dan Gurney was driving the fourth and final Cobra. 
The circuit was 42 miles, and after his rear suspension broke down, Gurney limped to the finish line, finishing 90 minutes later than he thought. Although his finish had secured the GT Class win for Shelby American, Dan had nobody to celebrate with. Shelby and the rest of the team had already headed to the hotel, not wanting to miss <laughs> dinner. <laughs> well, oh, my God. <laughs> well, uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, uh, we're we're still gonna clap when he comes in the room, right? As yeah, a, let's we'll order we'll order you a drink, Dan. Dan we'll we'll, we'll probably get let's get some appetizers for the table. Maybe he'll come in a little bit later. Yeah, and then Dan Dan likes bruschetta. So you guys like table fries? Table fries? <laughs> <laughs> uh, one bu- uh, plate of spaghetti for the table. <laughs> <laughs> at Le Mans, Dan raced with teammate Bob Bondurant. 1963 saw Shelby entering two Cobras, with one failing to finish the race and the other finishing seventh overall. Shelby knew he had to up his game. Enzo Ferrari had lobbied the FIA to loosen regulations on aerodynamics, and in 1964, aero restrictions were essentially eliminated. Shelby tapped Peter Brock, a 28 year old whiz kid. To design the body. This guy is Nolan's age. Yep. <laughs> uh, and Bob Nextet was given the job of designing the car suspension. The result was the legendary, legendary Shelby Daytona Coupe. A car tailor built to keep up with Ferrari in the straights. One of my favorite cars. We gotta do we're gonna do an episode on it in yeah, the future. D- Nolan actually uh two days ago pitched a, a Peter Brock episode of Pasco. Yeah. Two years before the events of Ford v. Ferrari at the 66 Le Mans, Gurney and Bondurant made history. On the very first day of practice, Dan clocked the fastest GT lap ever recorded at Le Mans, a practice session that also doubled as road testing since the car had not yet been driven. (laughs) Oh, man. Um, Bob Bondurant's in every single documentary about Shelby and like what happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There's that Beach Boys song about him. Bob, 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 Bob Durant. <laughs> Bob, Bob Durant, <laughs> I'm gonna take my car. <laughs> Bob Durant. He's got rocking a rockin' and a rollin', stoppin' in his mall. Bob Durant, Bob, 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 Bob Durant. Bob, 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 Bob Durant. That's, that, that's, uh, wow. you know, I, I was like, should I? And I'm glad I did. <laughs> yeah. Bob the Red. <laughs> it's so uh, good, dude. As the race began, Gurney and Bondurant led the GT class for nearly the entire race, slipping overnight as Ferrari overtook and led the GT field by sunup. In the second day of the race, high engine temperatures became a concern for the Cobra, but disaster didn't strike and Dan put in consistent lap times. By the time they'd finished, they were first in GT and a full lap ahead of their closest competitor. Wow. A Ferrari. It was a victory not just for Dan or Carroll Shelby, but for the future of American racing, which had never been so bright. The collaboration between Dan and Carroll continued throughout the 60s. At Sebring in 1966, legend had it that when Gurney took the lead driving a Ford GT40, Shelby leapt out of the pit and shook a hammer at Gurney as he zipped by. Apparently, Shelby's plan was for a Ford convertible or Roadster to win the race for publicity's sake, not Gurney's GT. Gurney confirmed the story decades later as he delivered the eulogy at Shelby's funeral, sharing that, I did not think the milk of human kindness should go quite that far. So the hammer came down, and I put out the finger the next time by showing Shelby who was number one. (laughs) Dude, flipping someone off... In a race <laughs> is so sick. It's like, so good. We just shot the the Dale Earnhardt uh, up to speed on Dale Earnhardt for our YouTube channel, and like there's there's a really good uh, middle finger joke or like story in there. Oh my god! And it's just like you're going 200 miles an hour. Like keep both hands on the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that is, <laughs> that's his signature too. That he's done it more than once. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Shelby had the last laugh, however. Gurney's car broke down just a couple hundred yards from the finish line, and Ken Miles won in a roadster, just like Shelby drew it up. Ken Miles. Dang. Dude, like, I... 
like I wish I was like part of this crew, but like I would just be like not even the tallest one and just like <laughs> probably probably not even the funniest one. <laughs> Part of what makes Dan Gurney such an impressive figure is how he seemed to be making racing history everywhere at once. Back in the United States, the biggest news of 1963 was the massive controversy at the Indy 500 over the quality of Firestone's tires. Goodyear saw an opening and got to work developing a tire for the Indy 500, kicking off an era known as the Tire Wars. Goodyear in particular approached Carroll, who was already working with Goodyear, to help develop cars for Indianapolis. Carroll was busy, but he had just the buddy for the job, Dan Gurney. When Carroll Shelby circa 1960s hands you a business opportunity, you don't say no. So in 1964, Dan went into business with the Cobra Man, forming All American Racers, or AAR, in Santa Ana, California. The name had been a suggestion of an employee by the name of Lester Holt, who had been an All American basketball player in college. Not to be confused with the newscaster, Lester Holt. Uh, <laughs> Definitely not the same guy. <laughs> I was like, what? The business was financially backed by Goodyear. AAR got to work building the so-called Indy Eagles, named for their fronts, which kind of looked like an open beak of a swooping eagle. For the color of the initial eagle, according to an All-American Racers employee, I almost said All-American Rejects employee, <laughs> Dan chose the color based on a, quote, 1942 Buick that a friend of his parents had drove to his house when he was a boy. It was called Nightshade Blue. There's no further info on what made that particular car stick out in Dan Gurney's imagination, but anyone who loves cars can identify it. Being a kid, seeing or riding around in some car thinking, this is it, I'm going to remember this, and someday maybe I'll even have it for myself. As AAR geared up, a division of the company was also created called Anglo-American Racers with the mission of building F1 versions of the mainstream all-American racer cars. This included the Eagle Westlake car featuring a V12 Westlake engine. Most importantly, the F1 Eagle was built for a tall driver, specifically Dan Gurney, to drive comfortably. So this is a car that you could fit in, James. The Eagle Mark I, also known as the Eagle T1G, debuted at Spa-Francorchamps in 1966. Although the car took some time to develop, in 1967, Dan finally broke through and won at Spa in an Eagle, becoming the first American to win an F1 race in a car of his own design. To date, it is only one of three times that an F1 driver has won with a car of their own construction, and one of those two wins for an American constructor. Most of the firsts we celebrate involve drivers driving faster or more dangerously than their predecessor. But in that way, Dan Gurney was also different. Arguably, among the most significant of his personal firsts for the history of racing came in the form of the first full-faced Bell brand helmet. The typical driver went with a helmet-goggle combo at the time. The full-faced helmet with a visor that extended from the forehead to the chin had its origins in dirt track motorcycle racing where riders needed a defense from flying rocks and debris. In his words, he, quote, caught my share of things in the face. <laughs> he introduced the helmet at Indianapolis in 1968, and when faced with heavy rain and fog at the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring the same year, he was the first to wear it in F1. Once more proving his versatility, in 1967, Dan again prevailed at Le Mans, driving alongside A.J. Foyt in a uh, Ford... GT40 Mark IV. But the biggest moment of the race came not on the track, but the podium. It was there that Dan was handed the traditional bottle of champagne. Up until that point, the understandable expectation was that the driver would tilt the glass bottle to his lips, allowing the liquid held within to enter his mouth, be <laughs> swallowed, and for the alcohol within the beverage to enter his bloodstream and give him a buzz. But Dan had a different idea. He shook the bottle, causing its contents to this. not enter his mouth. <laughs> I, I forgot that he's the guy who freaking invented this. That's right. He shook the <laughs> bottle, spraying the champagne all over the spectators, and thus the champagne shower, which really should be called the gurney shower, was born. Gurney shower is a different thing. I'll tell you about it. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, you can't. I'll tell you about it. Tell you about it when you're old enough. <laughs> uh, but, like, dude. You can't get a flap and a shower named after you. But like, <laughs> dude, you know the thing that 
every race car driver does when they win any race. Uh, yeah, he was the first to do it. Uh, yeah, so he invented the champagne shower, continuing his streak as the coolest guy ever. In 1968, Bobby Unser drove an eagle to victory at the Indy 500, and the All-American racers thrived, winning eight championships and 78 races. Good Lord. 1968 also saw the folding of the F1 wing of the company as Gurney decided to focus on his stateside efforts, so no more Anglo-American racing. Uh, it was a blow for those who hoped that an American team could establish a presence in the predominantly European league. To this day, while there has been the occasional presence of American teams in F1, none made the impact of AAR. However, there's hope. Uh, in the Haas F1 team based in Kannapolis, <laughs> North Carolina, which debuted in, in 2016. And although they haven't posted any wins, they were able to place a respectable fifth in the 2018 season. But we'll see how that goes. Uh, there's yeah, yeah. A lot of, lot of, bet, a lot of questionable what's, stuff going on. What's the whole backstory on the Russian livery? Uh, well, uh, their newest driver, Nikita Mazepin, his dad is Dmitry Mazepin, who owns like some huge sort of oil, natural gas empire, I believe. Oh, and he's like a backer. Yeah. And he's the main, like he's funding like the team, basically. <laughs> My son, he's oily, but he's fast. Put him in the driver's seat. <laughs> uh, there is one hilarious footnote to the All-American Racers F1 story. In 1969, a private driver by the name of Al Pease raced a non-works version of the Eagle at the 69 Canadian Grand Prix and actually became the only F1 driver in history to ever be disqualified for driving too slowly. At the time of his disqualification, he had completed 22 laps while the leaders were on lap 46. Oh my God. He got lapped 24 times. He's getting lapped. So he's getting lapped like literally every other lap. <laughs> yeah. That's insane. Jeez. In the late 60s, as Carroll Shelby was in the process of winding down his association with Ford, and Dan Gurney likewise looked elsewhere for opportunities. He still felt loyalty to the Blue Oval, but the culture at the company had strayed. Gurney referred to the Ford executive suite as having a myopic type of attitude. In his mind, Ford was more a politically loused up empire than it should be. At the age of 39, he was no longer a young driver, but his driving talents were still strong. Chrysler saw potential and made a deal for Gurney and All-American oh. Racers to enter into the 1970 Trans Am season. Gurney and teammate Swede Savage, sick name, drove a pair of Plymouth Barracudas at Laguna Seca and Lime Rock. But after the first two races, Chrysler got cold little feet, cutting the budget down to one car. This is so sick. Uh, this is like my new favorite race car, this Cuda that he drove. I didn't know that Gurney drove for Plymouth. And being a big Mopar guy, this immediately made me uh, um, turned on. Um yeah, the cool thing is our buddy Tony Angelo, he's got a drift CUDA of his own. And uh, while the paint job isn't exactly the same, it definitely borrows a lot of inspiration from Gurney's car. Uh, so I love Tony. Tony showed up on The Bachelor and I was like, I know that guy. Um, that was cool. I had to explain to my girlfriend what Hot Rod Garage was. Um, anyway. In 1970, Dan took the Chrysler setback as a sign and retired from competitive racing. The success of AAR has waxed and waned since then, at times employing as many as 140 people. In 1983, the company partnered with Toyota, of all companies, as they looked to make an entry into racing. Like many retired drivers, exceptions were made, and amongst the most memorable was in November 1971 when Dan and co-driver Brock Yates entered into the first ever running of an event called the Cannonball Baker Sea to Shining Sea Memorial Trophy Dash, a race from New York to Redondo Beach, California, that is now more often referred to as the Legendary Cannonball Run. He did a whole podcast on it. It was a fitting event for Dan, now 40. His family had made the same fateful trek from New York to California decades ago, a move that had been the first step in an epic automotive career. 
He didn't have much time to reflect. Dan and Brock driving a Ferrari Daytona made the trek in an incredible 35 hours, 54 minutes, winning the event and setting a record for crossing the continent on land. A feat for which the two received plenty of glory, but no prize money. The Daytona they won with, however, is now valued at several million dollars. 35 hours is really fast for that time, yeah. I feel like, because it's only gone down to like 27 recently, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, and that was during the pandemic when no one was on the road. Yeah. Dan also got into motorcycles, modifying a 1976 Honda XL350 and dubbing it the Alligator. What's that motorcycle? Oh, that's a cool <laughs> motorcycle. What do you call it? I call it the alligator. (laughs) It's called that because of its low slung frame. Uh, Instead of leaning over the frame of the bike, a low seat put the driver back almost as if you're driving a Japanese style motorcycle like it was a Harley. But his greatest contribution to racing development wasn't a bike or even a car. It was an aerodynamic innovation known as... The gurney flap. We can finally, finally we get to the flap content. I know you guys all clicked on this. Wanting to hear about the flap. All my flap heads, rise up, rise, rise up, up, flap, flap heads. Nation. We needed, <laughs> we needed to give a little bit of backstory, a little context to the guy behind the flap. But thank you for being patient. Thank you for sticking with us. Nolan, please... Give us some flap content. Hi you, you got bush? Definitely do if you haven't tried the best products from our sponsor today, Manscaped. After using these life-changing products, you're gonna wanna join a ball sack beauty contest, which I still haven't Googled and I'm never gonna Google that. I'm looking out for you because I also have an exclusive 20% off discount code, 20% off with the code gas20 at manscaped.com. You know, I like I, I read these ads a lot and there's a lot of goofy puns and stuff, but honestly, Manscaped makes some of the best products we've ever tested before. And I'm speaking from the heart when I say they are one of my favorite sponsors. Manscaped is dedicated to helping you level up your full body grooming game with their Perfect Package 3.0 kit. The Perfect Package 3.0 kit comes with the Essential Lawnmower 3.0, which is my favorite. Uh, It's a cordless body trimmer, and it also comes with a ton of other liquid formulations to help round out your grooming routine. So what are those, you ask me? Well, inside the perfect package, you'll also find the Manscaped Crop Preserve, which is a ball deodorant, helps your balls smell really good. And you get the Crop Reviver Ball Toner, which is a spray-on testy toner that's designed to make your balls smell irresistible. When we order this, be sure to add the refined cologne to your arsenal because balls smelling good is great, but when the rest of your body smells great, that's a winning combination. With a perfect package or performance package purchase, you get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag, which is valued at 39 bucks, and you get the patented high-performance anti-chafing Manscaped boxers, which I already told you are some of my favorite boxers. Get 20% off plus free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. And two free gifts. That's 20% off, free shipping, two free gifts at manscaped.com and use the code GAS20. It's 2021 and you still got bush? Change that with Manscaped. Thomas Crapper has the Crapper. Henry Heimlich has the Heimlich Maneuver. The seven Jacuzzi brothers have the Jacuzzi. (laughs) That's that's not a joke. Look it up. Dan Gurney also had an invention named after him, and its origins were, like most inventions, born out of a practical need. The practical need to crap. (laughs) In 1971, the All-American Racing Team was testing out a new car for the United States Auto Club, the sanctioning body of the Indy 500, amongst other races. There was a problem, though, with the car. After three days of testing, it was simply too slow, which is about the worst problem a race car can have. Bobby Unser was driving and, frustrated, asked his boss for a solution. Gurney suggested fitting a flap a small spoiler, essentially, along the trailing edge of the car's rear wing. There was immediate skepticism. Bobby Liebeck, an aerodynamic engineer with the doctorate to show for it, was present at the tests and told Gurney the idea wouldn't work. But the team was out of ideas, so they gave it a shot. Uh, Yeah, 
there's reason to believe like this this live bet guy had good reason because you've got your edge, you got the you got your wing, and then the edge of the wing. You know, you don't want a lot of drag. But what what um, Gurney was proposing was putting just like a small flap facing upwards at the edge of that wing, which would be like why why would you do that? Like that's impeding it airflow. Pushes down the uh, butt. Well, we'll get there. The flap was an immediate failure. <laughs> Bobby Unser had circled the track, but his times were no faster than before. Unser pitted the car and discreetly made his way over to Dan. He asked him if anybody was close by. In an uncharacteristically cagey way, he asked Dan if they could talk in private. It turned out that Unser was afraid of someone spying and finding out what he wanted to tell Dan, which was that the rear of the car was getting so much downforce that the car was now understeering, making it difficult to pilot around the track. The gurney flap was born, but its arrival was hardly shouted from the rooftops. When other teams asked, the explanation was that the flap provided structural enforcement to the wing. Some teams got smart to it and tried flaps of their own, but none of them understood the positioning of the flap, which had to be attached to the upper trailing edge to be effective, and their lap times didn't improve. Gurney himself didn't even understand how the <laughs> flap worked until months later when he was able to test the mechanism in a wind tunnel. So he was just oh. going off gut instinct. Oh, He's just like, I'm just okay. going to do this. Let's try it. I don't know. Uh, and it put a flap. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. We're out here. I don't know what it does, but I got a bunch of flaps lying around. Now this show is not bumper to bumper. So we won't get into all the crazy technical deal, uh, details that we're not exactly smart enough to understand, but the device essentially redistributed pressure on the wing, helping reduce pressure from the bottom of the wing and thus improving the downforce of the car. Dan patented the invention and the innovation spread throughout racing. For his part, Gurney was generally against the use of wings in racing, complaining that they quote, distorted the whole driving picture. The flap has probably found its greatest use on the rear stabilizers of helicopters where adjustable versions of the flap aid in stabilizing the aircraft. I'm never going in a helicopter. Never ever. ever. I've been in one I've 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 been in one helicopter uh and it was I think that was enough, you know. <laughs> like I said, I think during the flying cars episode I was talking about small aircraft. I'm just not not into them. Not I I no. don't need that. By the end of his career, Dan drove 312 races in 20 different countries, winning 51 of the events. Although he was no longer driving, Dan's company, AAR, was a force in racing throughout the 70s. For instance, at the 1973 Indy 500, 21 out of the 33 entries there were Eagles. Dan also had a reputation as a good boss who made good products, like his mentor, Carol Shelby. Dan also had a knack for attracting loyal employees and keeping them around for decades. More than any other American, Dan could honestly say he'd tried every dish at the old country buffet of automotive racing. <laughs> he'd won an F1, IndyCar, NASCAR, and sports car racing, becoming the first ever Finns. He invented the gurney flap and helped popularize the full face helmet. He'd even help influence music videos for decades to come by being the first person ever documented to spray champagne on the winner's podium. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's an achievement. All you know, who's the coolest guy who's ever lived? Yeah, yeah. That's why Nelly ded dedicates every album to Dan Gurney. <laughs> Along the way, Dan also collaborated with Carol Shelby and founded his own company that is still in operation today. All American Racers, now run by his son Justin. Everyone has had that friend who's just good at everything. It can kind of be infuriating and maybe a little jealousy provoking, but it's also pretty damn cool. Dan passed away in 2018 at the age of 86. In the end, it's safe to say that it's not his accomplishments that brought him the most joy, although if accomplishments make you happy, Dan was one happy man. Dan wasn't the typical race car megastar with a big ego and a big mouth. He was just a guy who really loved cars and racing and was lucky enough to do what he loved while also being 6'4". <laughs> He's the coolest <laughs> man to ever live. Like, you know that SNL sketch, Bill Brasky? Uh, yeah. The, they just <laughs> yeah. sit around and talk about how Bill Brasky is like 
just like this legendary dude. That's Dan Gurney. It's yeah. like Dan Gurney once battled a bear and skinned its hide, and then he stole my wife. Dan Gurney once lifted his car up with one <laughs> hand and changed the tire with the other. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Gurney's car once broke down at Lamont. So he ran for 18 hours straight and finished on podium. <laughs> like like I said, if you wrote Dan Gurney as a character, I would not believe it. Like my note would be like, yeah. listen, you got to make this guy you know, he's like too he's a pure hero. This is also the first <laughs> episode we've done where like everybody who shows up, I know their name. Yeah. Like I yeah. recognize literally every side character in this podcast as like it's like dewey cox it, yeah it's like dewey cox dan gurney is uh smart racing forrest gump <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's just like there for all of it yeah yeah so wow i i have like such a i mean again he's like one of those guys that showed up and you know every research we do and now i like really understand and appreciate the hell out of dan gurney i'm like i'm a i'm i'm a huge fan now yeah you know definitely a huge fan i didn't know anything about him other than the flap his flaps yeah. and his champagne spray but super cool and even super that cool. is and enough to be like oh like that's a lot yeah that's like legendary status right mm -hmm. there and then there's all this other stuff the whole like winning a uh, fins yeah he did win that fins i'm glad that we coined that term All right, so that is Dan Gurney. I hope you enjoyed that story. I know I did. Uh, had a great time talking with the boys, as always. You can follow them on all social media at Joe G. Weber and James Pumphrey. Give Joe some freaking love. Give Joe some love. Let's build follow that Joe. Let's keep it juiced. Joe is one of my favorite people, and I, I, want, I want his existence to be validated Aww. with numbers on a social media app. Um, oh, no. So please, please follow him. He's very funny. Follow James because he's just got the swag, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm known to have like pretty uh, legendary drip. So if you, we're trying to get James to one million subscribers, one million followers on all social platforms, yeah. and he's almost yeah, there. I want the, I want to be a TikToker. Tick, so that's that's Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. That's good. That's good. <laughs> A uh, big thank you to our producers, Thomas and Bridget, as always. Anyway, thank you very much for listening. Um, oh, you can follow me on Nolan J. Sykes. How about that? On that note, uh, it's time time to end. Goodbye. Good Goodbye. <laughs> Be kind. I love you. <laughs> and goodbye. <laughs>